Well, I'd like you to look here at our last chapter in Hosea chapter 14. This chapter, uh, you'll find to be maybe a little bit easier on the ears than earlier. You're not going to have any history. You don't have to go back to the great historical incidents of Israel as Hosea did. Gave you a little Old Testament survey in a lot of ways just to take you back to where you had fallen from as a nation of Israel. It's, not, it's a guilt-free, aren't you glad? It's guilt-free. Um, there's no uh, real uh, admonitions of how evil you are. We're not going to camp on that. And there's not even going to be a threat, uh, blatantly, of Assyria. What this is, it's like a Billy Graham, the end of Billy Graham's message. When Billy would, would talk to you about sin and about the death of Christ, and then he would end, remember, with, I'm going to ask every eye to close, no one looking around. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat, and I'm going to ask you to come. And in your coming, you will say, uh, I have sinned, Father, I have failed in my attempt to do life without you and I repent and I thank you for Christ and I come to him and I put all of my trust in him if you're with friends they'll wait if you're in a bus it will wait you come and you come with hundreds that are coming right now Just, uh, and it would start and it was his altar call that you would come forward to the altar and here you would meet God well that is what Hosea 14 is. It's the pleading of a father with a renegade nation that has hurt themselves. They have had 200 years of failure, and they're right on the cusp of chapter 13. Your little ones will be dashed in pieces, and your pregnant women will be ripped open. That's the last word. Come. So let's look at this altar call, and you'll see it's the stuff of the great many hymns that you and I, most of us here, grew up on, is the stuff of this chapter. Well, he says in verse 1, come home. Not simply do different, but return. It has the idea of repent. It means come back to me, O Israel, to Yahweh, your God, the one that chose you, the one that redeemed you in Egypt, cared for you in the land, took you into the promised land. This God, you come home. Don't do anything merely uh, different from what you've been doing. Not merely different. You come back to me. We sing it in our hymns. Remember this one? Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Calling for you and for me. See by the portals, he's waiting and watching. Watching for you and for me. Come home, come home. Ye who are weary, and sin is. You that are weary and heavy laden, come home. Well, come home to the God of the Bible, and in verse 14, the second line, because you have stumbled because of your iniquity. The reason you have fallen flat, the reason that you have experienced pain and failure and disappointment and dashed hopes and chaos and confusion and judgment is because of sin. You wandered from me, and that's why you're in pain. Y'all don't know if how many of you remember a fellow from Tekoa, Georgia, back in the 50s and 60s. He was integral to the foundation of the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. He was the strongest man on earth. His name was Paul Anderson. Five foot six, five seven, about 340, 360. Real stout rascal. And... Uh, he was an Olympian, Olympic gold medalist, but he would go around to high schools and do shows of strength, then he would share his testimony. And uh, I remember him telling a story. Whenever he would do squats, 
All right. He didn't have to, he didn't do them with normal Olympic weights because you had to stack on. He, he would squat like 1,100 pounds. That's what he would work out with, was 1,100 pounds. And uh, what he did to save time was he simply had in his home in Tacoa, Georgia, he had a bank safe that was put on a platform. Now, don't try this, okay? But he would get under that, ah, ah, go back in and watch a little TV. He used to say in repetitions, lifting weights, he said, anything over three is a waste. You just do heavy stuff. And so he would, he would work out with 1,100 pounds on a, on a bank safe. And one time he went out during an evening, a cold Georgia evening, he went out to, to do some squats out in his barn, and he got under this bank safe, and ah, it didn't move. He kind of backed away from it. That normally... Weight did not oppose him, you know. And he got back under it again. Ah! And it didn't move again. And he just looked at it and thought, what's the matter with me? Then he saw that in the cold that the mist had frozen. And the bank safe was frozen to the platform. And so Paul Anderson said, I was trying to lift the world. <laughs> and he would tell that story about when you're in rebellion against God... You're going against the entire created realm. And you can't lift yourself. That's the one thing no one can lift, is you can't lift yourself. The universe is just too strong. You don't have a place to pull from. And so he said, whenever you're alien to God, you're trying to lift the whole world. Amen? So God says, come home, because the reason you're in pain is your alien from me. And in verse 2, here's how I want you to come home. I want you to bring words with you and return. You don't need a sacrifice. You don't need to change your diet code to clean things. I want you to come with an apology. I want to get to your heart. And I want you to say this. I want you to say uh, take away all iniquity. I want you to ask for forgiveness, and I want you to admit you have sinned. That's all I want. This is what repentance begins with, is a recognition of moral guilt and that you're wrong in what you've done. I want you to ask for forgiveness. I don't you want you to appeal on how good you have been. I want you to state that you've been a sinner. And after you do that, I want you to say, receive us graciously. I want you to be back in fellowship with God. Return and receive. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. You come with empty hands. Silver and gold have I none. You come with empty hands. And if you will... Then in verse 2, you will present that we may present the fruit of our lips. The sacrifice that you will be presenting is the fruit of lips. The lips that first say, forgive me and show me grace. The next time you speak, it will be, thank you, God. And your life will change. Uh, we sing in one of our hymns. I will praise him forever and ever, for the cross made the difference for me. So come home. God will not fail you. The next words out of your mouth will be, thank you. Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called a son. I will go back and say, receive me as a hired servant. And the father saw him from a long way off. And he ran to meet him. And he said, put the ring on his finger, sandals on his feet, cloak, the robe on him, because this son of mine was lost and now he's found. He's dead and has come to life. When you're alien from God, you're a dead man. When you're alien from God, you are a, you're alien to life. You are lost. You don't, if you're dead to God, you don't know how to run life. You don't know who you are. 
I one time went and did a missionary trip over in Russia, and I had a, a translator named Galina, and she was my shadow, and I was happy as long as I was in her shadow. Because if I got away from my translator, this Russian native who knew everything I needed to know, once I got away from her, I was lost, I was alien, and I was a dead man. And so that's what it means to be alien to your creator. You don't know who he is, you don't know what you are, and you don't know what life is. You're a cosmic orphan. And so, in verse 3, I want you to admit this also. I want you to say that Assyria will not save us. My nifty turning to the world and its military and its power, I want you to admit that the mightiest thing on this earth will not save you. Billy Graham once went and spoke to Oxford, and he talked with a fellow just before he spoke named Clive Staples Lewis, otherwise known as C.S. Lewis. Would you be a little bit nervous if you were just a North Carolina boy speaking to Oxford? And Mr. Lewis called him aside and he said, Billy, remember, we're sinners. Meaning we don't need you to talk about Renaissance medieval art. We don't need you to talk about, you know, Hebrew language. That's not our problem. We're sinners. Talk to us about sin. Well, God says, you've got to say, Assyria, the mightiest nation on earth, I want to hear you say it. That the world will not save us. And I want to hear you say, we will not ride on horses. Now, what nation do you think of that you would look to for horses that Deuteronomy 17 says don't do it? It's south of Israel. It's got a guy named Pharaoh that runs it. Got big pyramids. Who are we talking about? Egypt. I don't want you to go to Egypt. I don't want you to go north to Assyria, and I don't want you to go south. I want you to admit to me that this world will not save you. And I want you to say to the work, when we will not say our God to the work of our hands. I want you to admit that the world's ideas of God and your ideas of God are wrong. I want you to say that. And I want you to admit at the end of verse 3 that in you the orphan finds mercy. That this is a, you are a personal God, you are a good God, and you're the God of the little fellow. Is there a God so great that he is the God of the entire universe, but a little bitty boy or a little bitty girl that is alien and scared can find rest in him? That's what I want you to say, that the infinite personal God will help you. The God of your fathers. Who's the orphan? The orphan is Israel. And this is, in, this is what we sing in another one of our hymns. I need thee every hour, most gracious God. No tender voice uh, like thine can peace afford. I need thee. Oh, I need thee. What's the next phrase? Every hour I need thee. Uh, Bless me now, O Savior, I come to thee. That's what you've got to say. This is called the stumbling block in the New Testament. This is why people have a problem with God. Is you have to admit that my rationale and reason are not smart enough. That I need the God of Revelation, the God of the Bible. And you have to admit that you're not good enough. That I'm a sinner and that my moral rectitude will not fix me. You've got to admit that. That you're intellectually, philosophically, noetically, and you are morally inept. And physically, that I'm not strong enough to fix myself. That's all you've got to do. You have to be honest, and you have to admit some things. And then you come to me 
for light, for forgiveness, and for rebirth. All you've got to do is own up and be honest. And that's why the world has a problem with the stumbling block of Christ. Do you all remember a fellow who had leprosy in the Old Testament named Naaman? And he was a wealthy, powerful individual that had conquered Israel. He conquered the house of the wicked northern kings. God used him even though he didn't realize it. And he got leprosy. And he's going to die slowly. And uh, a little girl, a slave girl from Israel, out of the mouth of babes, she said, I wish that my master, Naaman, was with the prophet in Samaria, Elisha, because Elisha could fix him. Well, you might not listen to a slave girl about the prophet of a conquered country unless you've got leprosy. And so he has no plan B. He's going to die. And so he, uh, he goes to the king and said, I, I'm going to go see him. The king wrote him a letter to the Jewish king because a prophet was considered kind of a crazy guy. I don't want to have to admit that God has spoken to these people. I want their king to give me healing, and I want you to write a letter that says he got to. So was his faith pure faith? It was flawed. And you remember he took all of his, and, and the king, he came to the king of Israel and the king said, this guy's trying to pick a fight with me. Am I God that I can heal the leper? I can do so much. Well, he's got to go to the prophet. Go to Elisha. He went to Elisha and he took all of his entourage. He took his horses. He took his wealth. He took his gold, silver, changes of clothes, because he's going to buy himself a healing. And so he shows up with Elisha. Elisha doesn't even come out to see him because he saw this is a guy that's going to demand from God to do what he wants him to do. He is, he, we're going to have to fix him. And he wouldn't go out to see him. He sent his servant who was named Gehazi. Don Knotts. That's who he was. It's Tim Conway. All right. And Gehazi went out. And it made him mad. I thought the prophet would come out here and wave his hand and say, you're healed? He came out and he said, hey, uh, if you want a healing, Elisha said, you got to go to the Jordan River and you got to take your clothes off. And then you got to jump in it seven times and then come out on a seventh time. And he said, are not the rivers of Syria a whole lot prettier than this nasty little Jordan River? You ever been to the Jordan? It ain't that pretty. We got the Tigris and Euphrates, son. I got more. I got rivers like you've never seen. No. Goodbye. I'm out of here. So the stumbling block, to have to admit that Israel's God and that God's prophet was the true God, that he was the only true God, and it just didn't sit well with him. Are we like that? No, you tell me to climb Everest to be saved, I can do it. You tell me to kneel before an implement of execution and admit that I need to be there and that I can be saved the same way as a prostitute or a pimp or a pusher, that's an embarrassment to me. Son, I got a degree. I've got a master's. I live in a house with 4,000 square feet. I drive a whatever, and no, I am not going to do that. Are you with me? That's called the stumbling block of the cross, having to bow beneath the yoke of grace. And his servant said to him, he said, uh, you know, master, if he had asked you to do something impossible, you'd have done it. All he asked you to do is wash and be clean. What he was saying was, the problem, Master, isn't him. The problem is you. But it's hard to rebuke a general. But that's what he meant. The problem isn't him. The problem's you. This is really the greatest thing you've ever heard of. You can keep all your money. 
It's free. All you've got to do is own up that this God is a great God and our gods are false. That's all he asks you to do. And Naaman said, okay. And he went and jumped, took his skivvies off. You ever seen a naked leper? (laughs) Well, I have. I spoke in the only leprosarium in the United States back in 1973. And you die by inches. And so he had to not just jump in and be healed. Now it would be a cooperation between God and him. You go in seven times. Six times you come out and you just, it looks, you're stupider the longer you do it, the stupider you are. And you're coming down to faith. And he comes in the seventh time and he comes out. You remember what it says? His flesh is like baby's flesh. In other words, he's born again. And then he said, hey, take all my money, please. It's not now a purchase. Thank you. And they said, no, he's not going to take a dime. We're not going to have anybody think you bought this. Then can I take something? What's that? I'd like two mules loads of this Jordan dirt that I used to hate. I'm going to take it home because that's the prettiest dirt I've ever seen. And I will never worship another God. It'd be like taking a crucifix and I'm going to wear it right here and I'm going to let everybody know. Incidentally, you never see uh, Naaman again. He might have lost his job. Who knows? Well, that's the stumbling block. And so God says, this is what you've got to do. First time I heard the gospel in my room in 1972, I said, that's, if that's not true, it should be. That's the greatest thing I've ever heard. And I didn't trust it because I knew I couldn't have God and me. One of us had to get out of the front seat. And God simply, in so many words, said, I'm not coming in here until you move aside. Get your hands off the wheel. I'm going to take over. And so, in verse uh, 4, here's what I'll do. You do it, and I will heal your apostasy. All the effects of your sin, the mess you have made of your life, I will heal the results of your falling away from me. It goes like this. Just as I am, thou wilt receive, wilt welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve, because thy promise I believe. In Hezekiah's day, there was a revival, and it says God healed the people. Their families got better. Their view of life got better. Their view of right and wrong got better. By his stripes, we are healed. We are removed from the effects of our sin. Uh, if you abide in my word and my word abides in you, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. You won't be like the demoniac anymore, cutting himself, crying out in the night, living among the dead, uh, shackled so he won't hurt somebody, running naked because he has no sense of propriety, alien to everybody but fellow dead guys but he sees Christ and he bows down and he says what have I to do with thee Jesus of Nazareth you and I are alien Jesus commands the demon what's your name that's a way of dominating somebody what's your name legion we're many be gone would you please not cast us into the abyss oh please 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 they're asking for mercy How about throwing us into the pigs? Go ahead. Remember what the pigs did? You see a picture of what the unclean do when possessed by the devil. They started downhill and got faster and faster and faster until they went into the abyss and they died. And that's the way that the world does when it's possessed by the devil. It goes downhill faster and faster. Why were they going downhill faster and faster? Because all the other pigs were. They were all pigs of a feather. (laughs) Boom. And you end up in hell. 
And then you remember what that demoniac did? He sat down. He was clothed. He was in his right mind, seated at the feet of Jesus. And then he volunteered for something. Mission work. I would like to get in that boat and go with you. Jesus said no. He did what the pigs wanted. He did what the demons wanted. But he didn't do what he wanted. No. You go back to your home. You start there. Before you do mission work, go home and tell everybody what God has done for you. Isn't that a great story? Well, I will heal like Nebuchadnezzar. This guy looks and sees, I don't need God. Look what I've done. God said, you don't want me? Let me make you the way that people are without me. You will eat grass like a cow. You will lose your mind. The eagle will have landed. You will grow hair on you like feathers. You will have fingernails like talons. You will be like men are away from me. You will be crazy. You will be a beast until you raise your eyes and your reason returns and you worship God, then you stand erect like a man. But you're going to have to get straight with me. So God says, I will heal you and then I will love you freely. I will reestablish fellowship. I'll get rid of your past and I will start a new present and a new future. Prodigal, you will have a new ring, a new cloak, new sandals, a new calf, and you and the Father will be merry together. He that keeps my word, John 14, 23. It's one of the verses that has always been a linchpin in my life. He that keeps my word, he it is who loves me. And he that loves me will be, and it's a verb, he will be loved by my Father. And I will love him. And I will, it's the word epiphany. I will disclose myself. I will appear upon that man. I will now guide his life. When I put my trust in Christ, I experience this very thing. All the scabs in my life from doing stupid, God began to heal. Because I quit doing stupid. He changed me. And then I experienced the hand of God guiding me now through life. God loved me freely. We sing, Come every soul with sin oppressed. There's mercy in the Lord. And there is. One of my favorite stories is a Welshman who was an alcoholic and during the Welsh revival, he trusted Christ as Savior, dramatically converted. And all of his old drinking buddies made fun of him. And they said to him, you really believe that Jesus turned water into wine? He said, well, in my house, he turned beer into furniture. <laughs> Meaning he changed my life. Draw me nearer and nearer nearer blessed Lord. You remember that? To the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, nearer, nearer blessed Lord to thy precious bleeding side. And so that's what I will do to you. I will fix you and I will give you a new life. And in verse 4, my anger has turned away. What that simply means is there is not one person anywhere in the Bible that God will turn away. Not once. I've been to seminary. I'm real smart. There's not one place in the Bible that a repentant sinner turns to God. And God says, I have disliked you for years. Not a one. Are there churches that will turn them away? All the time. The guy that was lowered through the roof couldn't get to Christ because of the crowd. Zacchaeus couldn't get to him because of the crowd. The woman with the issue of blood couldn't get to him because of the crowd. The woman that was a sinner couldn't get to him because of the Pharisee condescending upon her. The tax collector couldn't come near because of the Pharisee. I thank thee, O God, I'm not like other men, like this idiot. 
So there's a lot of times Christians will hold you at a distance. Can you be a person that has spent your whole life as a thief, be alienated from God, found guilty by Rome, put to death, and in the last few hours of your life, turn to the guy that three hours earlier you cursed, and he will say, uh, you will say, Jesus, remember me when you come today. You'll be with me in paradise. I'll do you one better. Is that possible? It is. And so you come and I will heal you. My word. Trust me. I will not turn you away. Well, in verse 5, here's what I will be. I will be like the dew. You're now going to begin growing. You're going to have life. You're going to quit going downhill. Did y'all, have y'all noticed your lawns are a little greener? There's a reason. Did y'all also notice you had big cracks in your lawn? Because it was dry and the ground was all congealed. And you had all the properties, you had CO2 was in the air. It could be taken in. You had minerals in the earth. They could be taken in. You had the invincibility of the sun shining for photosynthesis, but your plant was withering. You know why? Because all of those things surrounding it, it was alien to. The dirt was outside. As a result, you couldn't get chlorophyll. You couldn't have photosynthesis. You couldn't have growth. The roots were drying up because you didn't have a mediator to take the outside and bring it to the inside. You needed something. What was it? Water. It's the mediator. It's life. All of a sudden it rained, and now that little old plant was in congruence with reality. And now you got to mow. Same as me. So I'm going to give you life. And in verse four, uh, verse five, you will blossom. You're not going to be the ugliest thing on the block. I'm going to turn you into something other than an eyesore. I'm going to make you pretty in the sight of God and men. We're going to have people name their kids after you instead of picking them up in Kroger's and running from you. I'm going to make you something pretty. And he will, what's it say? Take root like the cedars of Lebanon. I'm going to make you strong. We can build with you now. Your life is going to take on hope. One of our staff came to me a while back and said, we got a guy just came into our ministry and he had been in jail. And he said to me, I, I got saved. He said, where at? At the Denton jail. He said, a guy came in there named Bob and preached. And he said, Bob Nelson? Yeah, that's Tom Nelson's brother. Wow, where is he? In heaven. He's gone home. No, yep. And he said, I wish I could thank him. My brother saw this guy come to faith. One time, my mother, when I went down, out, down to Waco, and she said, I got to tell you something, sit down. Yes, sir. I sat down. Not even on a chair, just right on the floor. When my mother would say, sit down, you sit down. <laughs> and she said, do you know who was out in front of the house a couple of weeks ago with his child walking around in his right mind? Corky Mahoney. I was like, back to the future, a million gigawatts! That's why I felt. Are you with me? Is anybody with me? Remember Doc, remember Doc Brown? <laughs> That's the way I was. Corky Mahoney! Corky Mahoney was the little Irish kid that lived three doors down. There was the Smiths, and then there was somebody else, and then there was the Mahoney's. Not the Macaulay's, the Scots that lived down this way. Not the Higginbotham's, the English that lived over here. Not Ronnie Jurgif, the pagan Czech that lived down the street, or even the Jewish Mr. Siegel that lived down here. This was Corky Mahoney. Corky Mahoney 
was a child of the corn. <laughs> he was redheaded. He had a brother named Marvin Mahoney. And they were the worst kids. We all stayed away. They ran over my brother's chicken with a lawnmower. <laughs> and my mother said, hey, Corky. And he went, God, how'd that happen? Yeah, it's under your lawnmower. A lot of times you run over chickens with your lawnmower. That was Corky Mahoney. She said he was out in front of the house. There was a young a man with his child leading him around, showing him where he had grown up, smiling. He was well tailored. And I walked out and I said, and who are you? He said, I used to live here. And who are you? I'm, you remember Corky Mahoney <laughs> and my mother. <laughs> And how long have you been out, Corky? <laughs> no, I'm a Baptist minister down going toward Houston. Corky Mahoney. There is a God, my friends. <laughs> no longer did you hide your chickens. He now teaches, and he was a fundamentalist and one of them one of them little Baptist denominations where the sign out front says, you're going to hell and I'm glad. You remember? <laughs> Who's a f Baptist? And not only will you be strong, your shoots will sprout. You know what that means? You're going to start little. Like when you cut a tr tree down and the stumps have shoots come out. It's the same word used for Jesus. His name should be called Branch. You're going to have life from the dead. You're going to look at your life and say, no way. Life is going to come forth. And uh, in verse 6, your beauty will be like the olive. You're going to be useful for light, for food, for the olive tree you used to sculpt with. It's the most useful of trees. The olive was to Israel like the buffalo was to the Native Americans. They used it for everything. You're going to be useful. Not only that, in verse 6, your fragrance will be like the cedars of Lebanon. You're going to be an aroma of Christ. You're going to be a delight. Those who live in his shadow will raise grain. You're going to be a protection to others. You're going to be bountiful. What did Christ say? I am come that you might have life and that abundantly. Not only that, in verse 7, you will blossom like the vine, the symbol of joy and happiness. You're going to laugh out loud someday. You're going to raise your hands in Christian hymns. Not only that, your renown, I'm going to make you famous like the wine of Lebanon. People are going to name their kids after you. That's what I will do with your life. It goes like this. Did you ever sing this? Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me. After thy will, while I am waiting, yield and still. What I can do with you. You are Petras. And on this rock, Christ, I will build my church. And I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. As the leader of the twelve, you're going to be the New Testament authority on truth. That's what I'll do with you. In verse 8, Ephraim. What more do I have to do with idols? Not what do I have to do with idols, but what more? Meaning you have wasted your life with idols. You've wasted your life with what you think is true. Come home. He says in verse 8, it's been long enough. Now is the day of salvation. Right now. I answer and look after you. 
What a verse. I am the God who speaks. I am the God who cares. I am the God who can do something. I am the God who will look after you. Tertullian, the third century, he said the soul of man is naturally Christian. Man is looking for a person, infinite, personal, that will love him, forgive him, and care for him. Sigmund Freud, in his atheism, said that all God was was man's highest dream imposed upon nature. Luke Ferry that wrote, he's a, he's a philosopher at, at the University of Paris, an atheist, wrote a book called The Short History of, or The Brief History of Thought. He said, the greatest of all ideas to give all answers is an infinite personal God that makes things, makes you in his image, gives ethic that is rooted in him, that makes man according to he is, that man's reason and senses can start him on a, 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 a way to know who God is and that God will make himself known in a complete way and when you die will save you and you can see your loved ones. He said that is the ideal of all philosophy. He said, I would become a Christian hands down, only I don't believe it. Luke Ferry. But he said, all that religion and philosophy is, is attempting to emulate the perfect system of Christianity by man's own, own reason. Isn't that sad? But he said, this is the perfect way. Uh, back in the days of the New Testament, the Greeks and the Romans turned away from the idea of God's and they began to seek reason. They had a word for it called the logos, logical, reason, the logos, truth, the word. And uh, just never could find it. Remember when John began his gospel to the world, the cosmos? God so loved the world. How did he begin it? In the beginning was the, was the word. He, he took a pagan term. He says, this is what you're looking for right here. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory. Paul, Acts 17 to Athens, saw the altar to an unknown God because all of their reasonings couldn't come to a place of rest. Maybe they missed one. Paul said, I want to tell you who he is. This is what you're looking for. How many of the Grimm's fairy tales do you see where you've got a woman that is loved but you'll never know it because she is eaten of the cursed apple because the wicked witch has brought a curse and she is lying dead and asleep and her only hope is that some prince what's the kind of prince is it prince charming a man who bathes all right <laughs> prince charming will do something kiss her just love her and she will awake, and he will sweep her up as all the little dwarves run off right here. A little seven of them, I believe. And take her to a mansion, a palace, and they will live how? Happily. For how long? Ever after. It's the ultimate dream. Well, God says, I answer and look after you. I'm your cypress protection. From me comes your fruit. Come ye sinners, poor and needy, weak and wounded, sick and sore. Come. In verse 9, whoever is wise, if you think you're smart, understand this. If you're discerning, know them. If you're wise, and if you have, and in and the Oriental idea, the Eastern idea, wisdom was not a theoretical thing of truth. It was virtue. It was the best way to live, the most successful for ways. It's why philosophy is called the queen of sciences. It's the basis of life, is to know truth. Incidentally, we have a term called the theory, finding your theory. You know where the word theory comes from? Theos, that means God. Oreo means to see. A theory is where you try to see God. Who is he? Well, if you're wise and discerning, God says, look no further. Here I am. 
Remember when Christ in the Gospel of John would be introduced by John and he would say seven times something. What is God's name in the Old Testament? Yahweh, that means? What's Yahweh mean? I am. Jesus, seven times. I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I said it seven times. You're looking for him? Here he is. In verse 9, here's why you need to know them, because the ways of the Lord are right. Biblical religion isn't true because it works. It works because it's true. It's right. If you're a righteous man, you're going to walk in them. Whenever you walk, you trust. You go forward one step and you catch yourself. Forward one step, you catch yourself. It's an act of faith. And you walk in life and progress. He says, that's what it's going to be like. If, you, if you're righteous, you're going to walk in my word. You're going to be successful. If you trust me, you're going to get along with people. You're going to get along with your mate. You're going to get along with your kids to a degree, somewhat, at any given time. You're not going to become a, blow your money. You're not going to blow yourself morally out the window. You're going to walk with me. But if you're a transgressor, you're going to stumble. You reject me, you're going to fall, you're going to fail, and you're going to hurt yourself. Come home. Father in heaven, how simple this text is. The pleading of a God with his creation. Somehow, O oh creation, you think that brilliance and strength is the rejection of the matrix the mother, the mater, that that is wisdom to reject the very foundation of your life. But you're dead. You're just sleeping. You're in suspended animation. Come to me, all that are weary and heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. I'm gentle. I am humble in spirit. You'll find rest for your souls. Father, if there's some guy or girl, man, woman here this morning that they don't know who they are, they don't know where they came from, they don't know what the universe is, they have just studied matter and mechanics, and they don't understand the origins and the destiny and the purpose of anything. And the only reason they're still sane is they will not deal with the issues. Bring them home. Our country. Oh God, we're so impressed with ourselves. Our science. Our technology. Our transportation. Our medicine that can keep a fallen human going for a few more months. But we can't change a soul. We can't fix a kid. We can't save anybody from death. And we for sure can't heal our own leprosy. We have found our Bana and Farpar rivers that are far better than the Jordan. The only problem is they don't save. Because you have said that in the cross, their man will meet his God. And so, Lord, we at this church cling to this ancient truth. We are the Jedis. We hold to the ancient truth most archetypical of ways, and that is the way of the Garden of Eden, that the seed of woman, a man, will crush the serpent's head, and the serpent will wound his heel. A man will die, bitten by sin, that other men might live. And all of your word just extrapolates and elongates and amplifies that idea of who the virgin-born child is. And so this hour, bring the lost home, O oh, shepherd. Might your elect hear the voice of Christ. Might they smell the foulness 
of any other way that is way, a way that is no more than just horizontal to them, that cannot lift them up, that cannot go beneath them into death itself to, ri- to raise them up. Might they hear the call of Christ this hour? And we'll ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.